Greetings with lovers everywhere and welcome to E-Train Talks. I'm E-Train. I'm a 13-year-old literacy advocate, book lover, and founder of E-Train Talks, Inc., a nonprofit dedicated to ending book deserts and inspiring the world one story at a time, which is pretty much the best way to inspire the world. So I've been looking forward to meeting and talking to today's guest for a very, very long time. Before I even started my podcast, back when I was recording book reviews in fourth grade for a school project, I read and reviewed the heartfelt, amazing book, The Remarkable Journey of Cody Sunrise. I have it right here. It's been on my bookshelf for years, and I truly love looking back at it and just thinking back to the incredible story. So I've been a huge fan of all of author Dan Gemeinhardt's middle grade books forever. And Dan is what I like to call a master storyteller. He crafts deeply moving tales that fill the heart with tremendous emotion and transports his readers directly into the hearts and souls of his characters and all the emotions and events they're going through. So if you didn't hear the first part already and you're still wondering who I'm talking to, well, like I mentioned, I'm talking with the incredible Dan Gemeinhardt, everybody. He is a New York Times bestselling author, a multi-award winner, and just an amazing person. Thank you so much for being here, Dan. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to talk with you and a, a big fan of everything you're doing um, and really appreciate all those kind words and looking forward to chatting with you today. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to chatting with you as well. So for those who don't know, Dan has many incredible middle grade books. So it all started with The Remarkable Journey of Cody Sunrise and my journey when it came to reading about his books. Dan is the author of many middle grade stories, including The Remarkable Journey of Cody Sunrise, The Honest Truth, Midnight Children, which I have right here, and of course, his latest and greatest middle grade book. I mean, they're all pretty great. Um, here is Coyote Lost and Found. It actually just came out this year. It was an instant New York Times bestseller, if you can believe that, everybody. So yeah, we have a lot to talk about. But first, <laughs> I'll talk about a question, or I'll ask a question that I really discovered that I wanted to ask about through research. That's why I do research, everybody. So <laughs> While doing research, I discovered that at one time, you and your wife spent time teaching, riding camels, and exploring Cairo in Egypt. So can you share how long ago your time in Egypt was, and if people have the similar access to books as here in the U.S., or if things were different? And did you visit any libraries during your stay? What was it all like? Great, great question. Um, so yeah, me and my wife, right after college, um, we were both teachers, and we had the opportunity to go teach abroad at an international school just outside of Cairo, in a suburb of Cairo, Egypt. Um, so this would have been 2002, 2003. Um, and wow. so it was kind of a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, but it was it was a fantastic experience. Egypt's a beautiful country. The people were amazing, um, super friendly, warm, awesome people. Um, really, really a great time there in Egypt. And um, let's see, a lot of questions. Um, I I suspect so. We didn't. I mean, I didn't. We I don't I I don't have a lot of knowledge of what life is like on the ground for say a working class family in Egypt. So right. we lived on our school's like campus. It was kind of like a compound. There was walls and guards and everything. And we spent a lot of time going into the other towns and stuff. Um, but our little experience was um, kind of maybe insulated um, from the everyday life. So I suspect that there's not a lot of great access to books in Egypt. Egypt is a country um, with a lot of disparity between the wealthy and the poor, like a huge, a huge gap. Um, and so the students that we were working with were definitely from the upper class and they were getting you know, dropped off in the morning by drivers and limos um, and getting picked up in the afternoon. Um, and so they, they, I mean, they had a pretty great life, I think. Um, awesome school, great libraries. Um, other people outside of that, outside of the upper class, I, I suspect uh, access to books and literacy and even like quality education. I don't know it, but I suspect um, not what we would hope for sure. Um, but it was a beautiful country and a great experience and just really, really wonderful people everywhere we went. That's wonderful. So, yeah. I mean, it's def well, not wonderful about the disparity between um, upper class and lower class or working class. But I do think that experience probably taught you a lot. So. My next question for you is moving towards your books. So Coyote, the protagonist of your Coyote Sunrise series, lives in a mobile home, aka an old school bus with your dad, Rodeo. So I think that's a really unique and not just that, but important aspect of the remarkable journey of Cody Sunrise. So I just really am curious that did you kind of go into mobile homes, school buses, um, and kind of take on the lives that Coyote and Rodeo experienced and also, I'm really curious, um, what sort of sparked this unique and, you know, different aspect, different theme than many books that I've seen? You know, as far as the living in a bus, there was no, so 
sometimes there's things you put in your stories that there's a reason like, oh, I put this here because I was whatever. This is why I did that. And sometimes, you know, it's just you're telling a story. Like anytime right. anyone tells a story, you put details in there. And like, why are the person's eyes brown instead of blue? Like no reason. Like I had to pick a color. I picked brown. The school bus is kind of like that. I mean, not exactly. Um, but I already had the idea for this girl and her dad living on the road, this living this kind of wandering roaming lifestyle. And so they could have been in a van, they could have been in a car, they could have been in a normal like motorhome RV. Um, but at some point early on, before I started writing it, I just got the idea of what if they lived on an old school bus? Because I mean, we've all seen those occasional funky buses um, that right. you can tell are no longer school buses, someone's living in there. Um, and I, I did some research online. It's, it's a it's a really active community. They call themselves schoolies. Um, and they buy old school buses and convert them. And and the work they do is amazing. So I follow a bunch of them now on Instagram and stuff. And some of their buses are like nicer than my house. They've got like hardwood floors and skylights and full kitchens and pretty amazing, which is not what Coyote has. Um, but I thought, oh, you know, if they're going to be living on the road, this would be kind of cool. This would be kind of different. And you're always looking for ways to turn your story up a little bit, to make it either a little more sad or a little more scary or a little more funny or a little more interesting, whatever, to try to grab you know, maybe a reluctant reader's interest. And so it just seemed like a girl and her dad living on an old school bus would be a little bit more interesting than a girl living in a van or a motorhome. And so it might, you know, just turn things up a little bit. And it seemed like a cool image and just seemed fun. And it fit kind of the funky vibe of Rodeo and Coyote and their their strange little life together. And so that's really kind of the only reason I had the school bus. And now I didn't actually ever live in a school bus to do research. I kind of pitched it to my wife because when I did the research, I found out that it's like really affordable to get an old school bus, at least more affordable than I thought, because like every school district in the country has, you know, hundreds of buses um, right. and they get rid of them every few years or whatever. And who wants to buy an old school bus? Not that many people. And so you can get like a full, at least this was years ago, but when I did the research, a full sized, full on school bus um, that's only a few years old for like $10,000. I mean, I thought it would be like $80,000 or something. Right. And so I, I pitched to my wife, let's go get an old school bus. And she was like, no, why would we ever do that? And she was right. I'm not a handy person. It would have been a disaster. It's a lot of work. Um, so no, but when I was doing the research, um, me and my two, two of my best friends, we did this big, long road trip. We rented an RV um, and we had no agenda. We had no set schedule where we were going to go or destinations. We just started driving. We did 10 days, started in San Diego, got as far north as North Dakota, as far east as Arkansas, and then looped back around through Texas and, and Arizona, New Mexico, and did this big 10-day trip living on the road to see kind of what that feels like. Because I've done road trips, but road trips are kind of different where you know where you're going and you've got a plan. Um, when you're kind of like living on the road and you know eating at truck stops and, and all that kind of stuff, it's a different feel to be wandering on the road as opposed to be traveling on the road. And so, I, yeah, I got some ideas from that. It was a fun, a fun thing to do that I could pretend was book research, what really just an excuse to go on a trip with my friends. Um, I, I did get some ideas for the book out of it. I love that. Yeah. And, you know, I really think, like you said, living on an old school bus, it really fits the vibe that we see for many interactions between Rodeo and Coyote. They always, it feels like they're always, you know, partying, they blast music and they meet hitchhikers, but it's not just that. There's also a lot of grief that's portrayed. So throughout Coyote's stories, um, well, actually in the first book, we learned that Coyote lost her sisters and mother in a car crash and they must find a way, Coyote and Rodeo, they must find a way to travel on both figuratively and literally without them. So there's really deep and moving themes that I just, I don't really see that often in middle grade. We see grief, but in the way you described Coyote's experiences, they were really engaging and I felt so much empathy towards them. So that leads me to my question. What is your process for writing sorrow and loss in a way that middle grade readers can relate to and empathize with without causing too much heartbreak, too much sort of pain in them but like that keeps them going on but understands yeah i'm rambling but yeah great question and you're right it is a fine little a thing i'm glad that it that it hit right for you um because that is like really really important stuff and really kind of sacred ground when you're talking about loss and grief and it's not just like a fun little plot point like it's pretty serious human stuff and you don't want to just use it to tell a story or uh not 
not take it seriously enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, but also you're really right because it's tricky to, because a middle grade, I love middle grade literature because it deals with all the same big themes as adult literature. Um, big, 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 big stuff. It's not just cute animal stories. Um, it deals with big, big stuff, um, right. but in you know approachable, en engaging way. But it is tricky when you're writing for your younger audience because you're right. You you want to make your audience feel things. That's the idea of any story. But you don't want to actually like traumatize them, of course, right. or even just like ruin their day. Like you want it to all be like in in the right the right zone. Like when you read a book and it makes you cry, that's great, uh, right? Like when you, whatever whatever you, a book is that you read and the dog dies at the end or whatever and you cry, that's really amazing and really kind of beautiful. But you don't want to like be devastated um, and like never be okay again. Um, and so it's, it's, it is tricky. And so I work on that. And that, that's just kind of going through it, revising, rewriting, having other people read it. Um, and sometimes I turn things up. Um, if I don't think it's emotional enough, some, a lot of times I'll turn things down. Like, oh, this is too, too, this is too much. Um, this is, it, it, maybe it's true and it fits the story, but it's just too much for, maybe some readers. And so it's just a really a matter of, of trying to get it right, but there's no like how. It's just a matter of reading and rereading and writing and rewriting and having other people read it and to try to dial those emotions in as 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 true as you can so it rings true and not overdone, um but in a way that's, you know, appropriate to the audience. So that's a really great answer. There's definitely a fine line between empathizing with the characters but also traumatizing the readers. And you do a really great job of sort of keeping it balanced keeping it in a way that readers can feel the feelings but it won't ruin their day like you said so my next question for you is about your story coyote lost and found it is your newest book it came out in may of 2024 this year at the time of recording and it was an instant new times bestseller so firstly congratulations and i think what's really special about this book sequel is that the first story the remarkable journey of coyote sunrise it came out in 2019 so it's almost like a four-year pause, or five-year pause, actually, for readers. Did you always intend to write more about Coyote's journey, or did the rest of the story come to you later? And how did you find a way to pick up your writing close to where you left off almost four years later? Yeah, a good question. So no, I would say not intentional. Um, that's just <laughs> kind of the way that it worked out. So I didn't... I didn't plan on necessarily writing another Coyote story, but I always hoped to write another Coyote story because I just love Coyote as a person, as a character. And I had a lot of fun writing her. She's totally different from me. She sees things differently than me. She says things differently than me. Um, but she was, from the day one, page one of book one, she was always ready to start talking. A lot of times in my writing, I'm struggling to find the voice and what would the character think and what would the character do and what would the character say. Never once in either of the two books that I struggle with Coyote, she was always ready to start talking. And I really just enjoyed her company. Um, and I got to spend all day with her for a year and it was wonderful. And she cracks me up and I just think she's a blast. And then I finished the book and then I never got to see her anymore. I felt like like my new best friend moved away. Um, and so I always like, man, I would love to tell another Coyote story just to spend more time with her because she's kind of delightful to have chatting in my head. Um, but you can't just have a character for a book. You have to have a story. Um, and so nothing came to me because, you know, sequels are tricky. Um, they need to be a lot like the first one. If it's totally different, then your reader's not going to like it. Because if they read the sequel or the next book, it's probably because they like the first one. And so they want something that's kind of in that same vein. But of course, it's got to also be different. It can't be exactly the same thing because that's lame and boring. Um, so it's got to be a lot the same, but a lot different. And you don't want it to be a disappointment to a reader. And so follow-up books are kind of tricky. Um, and I didn't have an idea that I liked for about four years. Um, but then this idea hit me, the idea with the ashes and the all the different, what makes Cowdy Lost and Found there. Um, and I thought, oh, that could be it. That could be a good follow-up that is similar enough, but different enough and moves the character forward and moves the story forward in an interesting, I, I hope, way. Um, and so then I jump right into it. I've set aside whatever else I was working on and I jumped into Cowdy Lost and Found. And so, yeah, the gap um, isn't great necessarily. Um, although it gave, you could say it gave, more readers, more chance to read the first one, maybe. Sure. So maybe I grew my audience. I don't know. Um, but yeah, and I'm now I'm in the same boat. Like I finished Coyote Lost and Found and I miss Coyote. Um, I don't know if I'll ever write another Coyote book, a third Coyote book, but I would love to. And so if I get an idea, um, I would hop into it. But so far, um, no ideas for a third Coyote story. So my next question for you is another question about Coyote Lost and Found. So a little bit about the storyline. So we're revisiting Coyote's life and find out that Coyote has to launch a road trip to solve a mystery that she must complete in order to honor her mom's important final request. However, Coyote realizes and knows from the start 
that she could not tell anybody the true reason they're on the road trip. I just think the storyline is so incredible. The way that you were able to keep the secret, find new and interesting ways to sort of keep it in only Coyote's brain, Coyote's mind, and keep other characters away, at least for the time being, from, for most of the book. So my question for you is, how'd you go about crafting like the storylines, like keeping the secret, figuring out how to write, write rodeo and ways for Coyote to hide the truth from him? You know, and again, that's kind of just a lot of thinking about it, writing and rewriting, and a lot of change. Like my revising um, is, is big stuff. Like when I'm doing my rewrites, it's not just like fixing the spelling and the punctuation. It's like I cut out whole chapters, put in whole new chapters, change the beginning, change the ending, big stuff, because I'm zooming out, kind of looking at the story and trying to put it together in the best possible way. And so even the fact that Coyote keeps that secret from her dad and from the other characters on this big big part of this journey they're on um that was not in my rough draft my rough draft right off the gate she just kind of announced what was going on and what had happened um and everyone knew and they were all talking about it um but in the second or third draft i kind of realized i think it would add more interest and more excitement and certainly a lot more tension if she kept a big chunk of this information back because um then you're kind of worried about people finding out she's certainly worried about people finding out but maybe the reader is as well um and also she's feeling bad about keeping the secret um and what's going to happen when it comes out and so it it adds this kind of this rising waters and the, this increasing stakes and tension um which which wasn't there before the plot's basically exactly the same but just keeping that information back really changes the whole complexion of it and adds hopefully a lot more interest and tension. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily, those kinds of things don't always come to you when you come up with a story or even when you write the story, it comes through zooming out, looking at it again, rewriting, revising, thinking what can make this better? Oh, I feel like there's not enough tension maybe in this first third. Um, so how could I add some tension? And then a good way to add tension is always to have some sort of secret of some sort of ticking clock. When is the other shoe going to drop um, is, is just a great, way to add tension to any story. Um, and so, yeah, it's a lot of tinkering. And again, I mean, I'm kind of a broken record, but getting other people's feedback, walking away and coming back to it, looking at it with fresh eyes and saying, like, my loyalty is not to what I wrote. So it's a lot of work to do these big rewrites. It'd be easier just to keep it as it was. And it might have been OK as it was, but like and that would have been easier on me to keep it as right. it was. Like my loyalty is not to myself or to what I wrote. My loyalty is to the reader, but also to the story itself. How would the story be best? Oh my gosh, the story would be best this way. That's going to be a hundred hours of work. You know, oh, well, I want this story to be as good as I can make it and my reader to be as, as happy as they can be. And so I'm going to roll up my sleeves and do that work um, to hopefully make the story the best that it can be. Well, I certainly thought that the story was incredible, and I'm sure everybody else who's watching does think that as well. So let's shift gears towards midnight, the Midnight Children. Um, it really took shape thanks to the element of curiosity in your character, specifically Ravani, who's the main character. So he always looks for the bigger picture, and thanks to Ravani's perceptiveness and loneliness, he discovers the runaway kids, new protagonists, new characters that I really loved, and he helps them out. So why did you feel the char characteristic of curiosity is so crucial in not just the Midnight Children, but in all of your stories? Oh, nice. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so Ravani was a tricky main character to write because he, at the beginning, the, the danger was him being a little too passive because he's... Um, he's like the opposite of Coyote when it comes to personality. So Coyote is confident and she is loud and she is opinionated um, and, and all these great things, which I think make her fun and her voice fun. And Ravani is quiet. He has no self-confidence. Um, he is friendless and lonely. He's been bullied. Um, and, and so he's not going to be the bold, brash character that Coyote is, um, which is tricky because, you know, in a good story, the, the main character is driving the action. So the story isn't happening to the main character. The main character is making the story happen through their choices, through their actions. And if you have kind of a passive, quiet, timid character, um, which is good and important and realistic, a lot of us have that in us or are that at some times, there's lots of people that are, you know, dealing with those kinds of things. Um, but it's tricky to make the story work sometimes because maybe they're not making those bold choices and decisions to make the story happen. Um, and, but so with, with Ravani, I gave him that curiosity, right? So he's, he's not passive. He's certainly not confident because of the way people have treated him, but he's not completely passive and inert. Um, and he's curious and he's also, um, he's like hungry. Like he is craving connection and friendship. He is tired of being lonely. He's tired of feeling worthless. And so even though on the inside, maybe he doesn't want to take those big leaps. He is so lonely um, that 
that is his motivation for reaching out to these new kids that showed up, these ragabonds. And, and he's the one that kind of reaches out and he brings them a present. And he, he even though he's, you know, unconfident and stuff, um, he's so desperate for friendship that that is his motivation. And so that's one thing that just felt realistic. It felt like that's where Ravani would be emotionally um, with his with the, the life that he's been living. That when he sees a chance at something else, something different, something better, he's going to maybe find that courage to make that leap. Um, it also just was kind of necessary for the story to make the story work. That if he wasn't willing to reach out, um, if they did all the reaching out, that could work, um, but it wouldn't be as satisfying because, again, you want the main character kind of driving the, the action. So it was a tricky, like I said, I never struggled with Coyote as a character. I did struggle with Ravani a little bit to make him work, to make him feel real and believable and to drive the action. Um, but I, I'm happy with how it turned out. So I know a new book of yours recently came out and it's a picture book. I firmly believe that picture books should be for all ages. So, of course, I'm dying to know a little bit about your new story, Once Upon a Friend. So can you share a bit about your new story and like the themes that are portrayed in it? Sure. So it's a, yeah, it just came out. Thank you. I'm excited because for years I was an elementary teacher librarian. That was my job for 13 years. So I was a, a librarian in elementary school. And so I read a lot of picture books to the, to my little guys, uh, kindergartners, first graders, second graders, third graders, and sometimes fourth and fifth graders, because you're right there for everybody. Um, and also to my own kids, um, read hundreds and hundreds of hours of picture books. And so I love picture books. Also love middle grade novels, of course, um, but I've written a few of those. And so it is just delightful to have a picture book out there in the world because it's a whole different experience to read a picture book um, with a littler kiddo and look at the pictures and turn the pages and point and find the stuff in the pictures. Um, I just love picture books. So Once Upon a Friend um, is, it's kind of my uh, kind of ode to the the beauty and the power and importance of books and stories in our lives. Um, Cause books have always been a through line in my own life from the time my earliest memories, loving books and libraries and reading and stories up through now and through being a teacher and a librarian and now an author, um, like books have been the constant in my life. And they, it's been a great, a, a source of great you know, inspiration and joy and all these great things, as you well know, the importance of books. And so it's about a young reader who loves this character. So it's in the, in the book, it's um, a repeated character. So in our world, you could think of like Elephant and Piggy or the Berenstain Bears or Junie B. Jones. There's, in the world of the book, there's many books with this character. And this kid loves this character. And the character, Migo, is kind of personified in the book and they love the kid. Um, and so it's actually told from... The character's perspective um and how they this, this kid and this character form this friendship and how um even though it's very simple i'm, I'm my summary is going to be longer than the actual book um but the uh the kid can use the what he what they learn from the stories throughout their life as they face um scary days in their life like the first day of school they can remember the time that their character faced scary days and so that the books and those stories and that character are with them all the time even as they grow old um and then i mean kind of spoiler alert it ends with that reader now an adult reading those books to their own young child and so it just which is what happened to me like i as a kid i loved the berenstain bears my parents read berenstain bears to me and now as a grown up um i read those stories to my kids and so it definitely it's a, it's about um, books and stories and how awesome they can be in our lives from childhood on through. That sounds like such a sweet book. I, I need to get it for myself now. <laughs> so my next question for you is a question that I've asked every single person that I've interviewed. If you could be or meet any literary character, that could be your favorite author or your favorite character in a story, who would it be and why? Oh, it's such a good question. So no surprise, I'm a huge reader. I read two or three books a week. Um, <clears throat> and so I have a ton of, of favorite characters from books I've read over the years. Um, and that's, you know, that's tricky because there's so many, like I'm going back on, you know, 40 years of reading. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I love um, from Out of My Mind by Sharon Draper, um, oh, yeah. the main character, that Melody. Um, uh, she would be amazing to meet. Um, and one of my favorite characters who kind of reminds me of Coyote, big personality um, from the book Three Times Lucky by Sheila Turnage, the main character. Love that book. Mo. Yep, Mo is a fantastic big voice, big personality, hilarious. I laughed out loud many times in that book. Um, I would like to meet, I mean, in the animal kingdom, 
Um, how about Ivan from the one and only Ivan? Wouldn't that be kind of amazing? Or um, <laughs> Templeton, the rat from Charlotte's Web. He's a funny guy. Uh, I could hang out with Templeton for an afternoon. Um, you know, there's kind of an obscure book. I don't know if it's obscure, but um, I had it recommended to me by another author. And me and my oldest daughter read it when she was probably 12. Um, it's a little edgy. It's categorized as middle grade, but it's a little edgy. But it's called Lucky Strikes by Lewis Maynard or Bayard. Um, and it's got a really funny um tough, interesting main character named Amelia. Um, and she's kind of like Mo from Three Times Lucky, big personality, um, dealing with some tough stuff, but has a really incredible resilience to her and, and humor to her. Um, so, I mean, those are some of my favorite, favorite characters, but I mean, I could go on all day about books and characters and authors for sure. I love that. Those are perfect answers. And I love how you tied it back into your own characters because those have a piece of your heart as well. And now... This is a new question that started asking, if you could choose one song that best represents Coyote Lost and Found, what song would it be and why? There is a song that I um, think would hit both the kind of, um, I don't know what sad is right, the more emotional elements of the song of the, of the book, but also kind of the triumphant singing along, shouting kinds of parts of the story. Um, and it might be mentioned in the book. It's just crazy that I wouldn't recognize, remember that, right? Because it's my most recent book. But again, my revisions are big. I cut out a million things, put a million things in. And sometimes I know at one point it was in there. I can't remember if I cut it out or not. Um, because there's a lot of songs mentioned in Copy Lost and Found. Um, and sometimes I change those songs or cut out a scene. Okay, but it may or may not be in there, but it's it's by Florence and the Machine. Um, and it's called I forget, it's either called Shake It Out or Shake It Off. Um, and it's just great song. Starts out, like I said, kind of slow and kind of emotional, but then it ends in this big, big, awesome moment. Um, I think they might dance and sing along to it, but I might have changed that at some point. But that's a song that I learned in a book. So like um, I read books all the time and a lot of times they'll mention, you know, whatever, a song or another book or a painting. I would like to check those out. Like what is this narrator, this character talking about? And that's a song I learned from a YA book called All My Rage by Subbatier, which is amazing. Um, and that song was mentioned, Shake It Out by Florence and the Machine, and I listened to it, and it's incredible, and I've listened to it a million times since, and I might have put it in that book at some at one point I did. Um, so I think that would be a great a great theme song for Coyote Lost and Found. I'm definitely going to have to check out Shake It Out, because that sounds like the perfect song for me. And like a dance song, a sing-along sort of thing. Maybe not a sing-along, but definitely. That's a pretty good sing-along. And it's also like triumphant. It's about rising above things and and and, and finding your own joy. And it's it's it, I think it'd be a good a good fit for the book. Yeah. So thank you so, so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with me today, Dan. I know you've been on trips, you've been on author visits, you're doing all these sorts of things. Of course, you're writing too. And I'm really grateful that you took time. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for all that you do supporting books and authors and literacy and kids. It's amazing. And thanks for having me this morning. I had a great time chatting with you. I had a great time chatting with you as well. And through research, through this interview, I've learned so much about you and for instance, you went to Gonzaga. Universe, you went to Gonzaga. That's where my cousin goes. So go, oh, nice. go Bulldogs. Um, yeah. And you're, you know, you're an author. You're an, you were a librarian. You're a teacher. You've done so many amazing things, all surrounded by books, all connecting to stories. And you know, books can never leave you, and they're always going to be in your heart. And I will forever cherish this chat in my heart. And Let's give Dan one last round of applause, everybody. This is such an awesome interview. I've learned a lot. I'm sure you've all learned a lot. And you'll also learn that you've got to check out all of Dan Gamayhart's amazing stories. They're truly phenomenal, and you're going to love them. So whether it's Once Upon a Friend, his new picture book out in June, or it's Coyote Lost and Found, actually, maybe start off with Thermark Wooden and Coyote Sunrise, the first book. Check out Dan's stories, and I hope you'll come back and talk again with me sometime, Dan. But until then, everybody, stay safe, keep reading, and I'll see you all in the next one.